I understand we've established contact with Canada, uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor David Castle. Many of you will be familiar with David. Um, a highly cited researcher and now scientific director of the Centre for Complex Interventions. Wouldn't it be good to have one of those at the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health in Toronto? And of course, previously Professor of Psychiatry at St Vincent's in Melbourne. And David was one of the authors of our college guidelines on the treatment of schizophrenia and psychotic disorder and had a really long standing interest in how to organise services and in comorbidity with physical health problems. But his topic today is, I think, a very important one. Improving the physical health of people with mental health problems. Is there a role for peer workers? Okay, look, thank you um, so much um, for the opportunity to talk uh, today. And I love these comments which have just been um, given. Um, and um, also commend uh, Russell and the team and everybody for the amazing work which they have, have done. Um, this is very dear to my heart um, because it touches on two issues which I think are critical um, to how we need to take things forward. And as Russell and others have said, a lot of good work has been done, but there's a lot more to do. And I'm having real difficulties with the technology here for some reason. Um, I can hear my own voice, but I can't... Um, but, it, but there's a very long lag on it. So I'm not quite sure what to do. I've had this problem before. Um, what I do have here, um, Mal Hopwood um, and Russell, you'll be pleased to know, is um, my little hawk's um, teddy bear. So I can share that. But I'm not sure if I can share anything else. Um, I'm going to flick through um, s slides and um, very much hope that I, I can be um, heard. So, basically, um, as I said, uh, you know, this is uh, an important, a very, very important issue, and we have, we have come to a certain pass with this. And so we also do need to be absolutely sure that we continue this uh, journey together. And my bet is that the only way we really got to tackle these issues is to do it in conjunction with clinicians of all persuasions, um, as well as with uh, patients and carers. And we already have heard from uh, patients and carers um, today. And of course, they are uh, critical to these um, ways of going forward in terms of trying to address these really appalling um, inconsistencies in the way healthcare is both uh, provided uh, as well as received by people with uh, mental health problems. Um, so this is a slide which I really like to show. It's from an Australian study called the Study of High Impact Psychoses. And um, it's a illustration of the underlying problem of cardiometabolic risk for people with psychotic um, disorders. I use this term called psychotic disorder very broadly, by the way. Um, it um, refers to people with, who were included in the study who had this disorder, which we call schizophrenia. They believe in that or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the, the point is that uh, these are people with uh, these issues for which often they would receive certain medications which might make things worse for them. And I'll talk about that shortly. What is more opposite is that these, uh, that individuals with schizophrenia-related disorders and bipolar disorder are also at risk um, by dint of underlying uh, risk factors um, for cardiometabolic um, problems. And that is shown here, and I'll just orientate you to the slide. So the top panel looks at males and females um, and looks at uh, a very good indicator of cardiovascular risk, which is waste circumference. And uh, what it shows is for males and females in the red line, or people living with psychotic disorders, and you can see that they are above the dotted line, and the dotted line is the risk threshold for waist circumference. Very important, though, is that this happens very early on. If you look at the um, x-axis, it is age. And you can see that from even in the teens, that's coming into your first episode 
uh, males and for females it's even more dramatic are at risk in terms of this uh, specific uh, parameter. And we can show any uh, metric um, and uh, here at, at, at the panel is um, triglycerides. Um, so we have a ticking time problem, if you like, and we have to get in and diffuse that. And we have to, as I said, all work together um, to do so. And one of the things we should not do is to use medications which are going to exacerbate the problem. And this is a very famous um, graph which shows if you look at antipsychotic medications that this dotted line is the neutral line for not contributing metabolic risk. And very few, there are few medications which are around that dotted line. Um, and you can read what they are. Um, these are medications which I would suggest to you have certain advantages. That's not to say they need to be used for everybody and they don't even need necessarily to be used first line for everybody, but it needs to be part of the discussion which a clinician has with a person who is about to receive these medications. Because there are others up here which unfortunately um, are often used early in the course of the illness and um, they cause a great deal of weight gain. So here, yeah, four um, kilograms of, of some six weeks or 10 weeks sorry, um, it is a substantial amount of weight gain. So I'm not saying that everybody should have these meds or these meds, but I am saying it needs to be an informed and personal choice and that clinicians need to be, need to be very upfront and open about them. And we also need to listen to the peer intervention voice. So I was um, really privileged to be part of, um, some of the workshops around the Equal Well Initiative in, in Australia. And um, what was very, very, very strongly heard was the desire for more uh, peer workers. I call them, I call peer workers um, just one term, you could say lived experience, people with lived experience of uh, mental health issues and, and um, metabolic uh, health issues. So what we needed to do then was to understand what is the strength of the actual evidence? Because if you're going to uh, put uh, this forward as, as, as a potential solution or part of the solution, and coming back to what our speakers from the floor said earlier, um, it's part of the solution um, that uh, the evidence base needs to be built because you need to be sure that you're doing positive and not negative things. And you also need to build cost around it so to show that it's cost effective. And in fact, we undertook to do this review and um, the peer interventions have been shown to be helpful um, and that um, individually or group based, they can help um, in terms of psychoeducation, social support, uh, specific uh, mental health interventions, and also to facilitate a myriad of other interventions. And some of the advantages include um, things which would be very opposite and very important for people with severe mental illness as well as chronic disease, um, physical health, chronic disease symptoms. And things like illness self-management, things like self-efficacy, feeling that you're in control of things, hope, recovery, empowerment, physical activity, and so forth. So the pros and cons then of the peer interventions, at least just some of the pros, and I'm a great fan of peer intervention uh, facilitators, by the way. Uh, so I'm very more on the side of the pros than the cons. Um, but, you know, in a true... Uh, participatory framework, um, we have to have people actually involved in the process of the development of these interventions. Um, peer workers can enable more effective engagement um, and um, under help people to negotiate complex system. Cost effectiveness, I put may, well, um, we need to actually look at that um, better. Um, you would think on the face of it, it's obvious. Um, but health economics is an art in itself, and we need to show that because that's what government is listed. And I know you're about to face a federal government in Australia, so it's an opportunity to be pushing these agendas. 
And also, um, you know, the equal and empathetic relationship between peers and participants. This is so, so um, important and is something I've seen in my clinical practice, how um, this engagement and this human connection uh, can really be the thing which uh, can break the ice with regard to um, these sorts of uh, care uh, packages and, and the negotiation of care pathways. Um, are there cons? Well, there's arguably cons to everything um, in life. Um, one of the issues is um, peer workers need to be properly supported in and of themselves, and they need to be trained properly in and of themselves. Because to put them into a work environment when they're not properly supported and don't have the knowledge base um, is placing them in, in an invidious position. Um, so there's work which needs to be done around that. And um, we also need to be sure that we do uh, listen to what is happening for them in terms of the impact of what they're doing on their own um, physical and uh, mental health. So I'm conscious that I have very few minutes left um, because we started slightly late. Um, and, uh, but I did want to share this uh, because it was a bit of a challenge to say, um, some of the people in the uh, processes around equally well were a little bit skeptical about evidence base for peer workers. So we did a systematic review and a, what's called a meta analysis. Meta analysis, you take all of the data which are out there and put them in a computer which spits out a sort of diagnosis. Uh, sorry, not a diagnosis, a, an overall um, uh, outcome. And um, my colleague, Alex. Carlos did this, found 12 randomized control trials. Randomized control trials were the gold standard for these um, sorts of interventions. And what we found in the systematic review was eight of the 12 studies showed improvement in at least one physical health domain, be that physical health, physical activity, healthy eating, or body mass. Needs. Most of the effective ones, interestingly, included group-based aerobic exercise as part of the intervention. Uh, but um, the, uh, inter the interventions themselves were very diverse, and that's another thing which we need to uh, work on, is making sure that the um, interventions are evidence-based, have what we call fidelity, and also are um, delivered in a way which is acceptable to all parties, and that includes services, by the way. So services need to be involved in the strategy around this. This is just a better, and this is called forest plot, shows from the systematic review, both the out, overall outcomes as, as well as the strength, the um, rating of, of um, the uh, trials um, that's called risk and bias. Um, so in fact, a lot of these trials were very good, large, well-powered um, trials. And you can see physical activity, for example, So this is hugely um, important and gave us um, the uh, push away study, uh, which would actually take hopefully this whole field forward. Now, again, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to flick through this very um, quickly. But just to say um, our intervention, such as it is in planning at the moment, um, will involve um, at least two peer workers, and we're just bringing on those peer workers to actually help us develop the whole process. Uh, properly as in a co-design way. We are looking at psychoeducation. education, we're looking at aerobic exercise, we're looking at um, the peer working alongside clinicians to deliver group-based interventions every week, um, but then also to do follow-ups one-to-one with each individual to make sure that they are tracking in the right way, um, um, addressing any barriers they might have, um, and um, the um, just generally keeping things on track. This is how it looks. We're going to compare it to what's called TAU, which is treatment as usual. Um, and we're going to look at a whole lot of um, outcomes. This is the overall look of the, the modules. Um, we are privileged to have learned a lot about this from um, people in various parts of the world, including um, 
in Australia, um, especially the, the Bond Open Group. Um, so to, to thank them and, and acknowledge their great work. And um, we are looking at the peers playing a critical linking role here with these uh, close contact both within the group setting, but also individually. Of course, diet is very important and exercise is very important as part of this. I always like this image because it seems ridiculous that she seems so happy on the treadmill. The diet and exercise are key components of this and also asking the question about what medications we use as when, how, and that needs to be a true shared decision-making process between clinicians and patients. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for all the technological problems, but those are beyond my um, control. And I'm going to stop sharing and ask any of that actually um, came through in a coherent way. <laughs>